thing where by those years, you know, living for you don't know Chile, but this is the information. We were living very close to the BOB River, that is really be the center of Chile until the southern of Argentina. So it's a big wow. extension <laughs> land where our people just live. Today we are just 10% of the Chilean population. And the area where we live, we can say that is probably if we compare the hectares, you know, um, as you can see here, the the nap nakba it has been important. The Syrian first for the Spanish crown and all the different governments that we have in power, including the, the current government. That a lot of communities, you know, we're always hopeful that the new government we look into our issues and they will respect the international agreement 169. And that respecting that agreement um, means we will have an opportunity, you know, in a peaceful way to do snow work. We're just using the mics for the webinar now. Okay. Because of the echo in the room. So you're right. talking to the room, but hopefully to the webinar. All right, perfect. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so. Basically, yeah, we are always hoping that something could change. But it's a good thing and it's a good feeling that you know that you people will continue fighting to remain in your land. We'll continue protecting the territory. So that's how as the Mapuche people we have been until today surviving. We were not defeated by the Spanish crowd. We made a treaty. They made treaties with us as a way to respect our territory, you know, from Bio Bio River, the North Crown property, and from the Bio Bio River to the South, it was Mapuche land. So it was the descendants of the Spanish people, or the people who independence, you know, Chile from the Spanish crown. The man starts questioning, oh, why is Mapuche? have authority and they're independent of our governments. And that's when the second invasion happened. And yes, we were defeated in the sense that we didn't have the same weapons to defend ourselves from them. But they haven't defeated our spirit and they haven't managed to erase our culture. Because that's what they have been trying to do. They have been trying to assimilate us into the Chilean people, erase our language, erase our culture, you know, trying to make us believe that we are Chileans and that we are all the same. That's why we, we don't exist in the Chilean constitution. You know, Chilean, in the Chilean constitution, there is just Chileans and probably some foreign people who come from the West. But no indigenous people, and this is not just for the Mapuche. This also affects indigenous in the north of Chile, like the Aguilas and many other communities in that area. But when you go to the school, in, to the Chilean world, when you talk about my people, they talk about like we are the ancestors of the Chilean people. And we are dead, alive. But you see, this is the way colonialism, assimilation, you know, that this is the way they work. They militarize our community. This is part of also the NAFTA. My community has been militarized uh, since 1973, because 1970, when Salvador Allende, it was the only government who tried to give uh, some land to my people. Of course, he had a coup d'etat organized by the United States and the rich people in Chile. And he was killed, or he killed himself. There is two stories here yeah, out there. <laughs> and immediately the military came to, into our land and take our land back. And it was worse because they take they took more than they had before. We have forestry companies, we have hydroelectric companies, we have tourism companies in our land, in our territory. So this, that's the reason. This is the NAFTA. Yeah? That's why they do it. Displacement, because they have business in place. 
So yeah, we feel very, very close to the Palestinian struggle and the Palestinian people. We cannot compare, you know, the two cases, but yes, we have similitudes. You know, the way they 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 treat indigenous people, the way they try to erase us from from earth, who assimilate us, is the same. These are the same companies, the same countries, and they use similar ways. You know, we haven't had the genocide that our brothers and sisters are having at the moment, or they have been having for over 70 years. That's why we solidarize and we feel so connected to the Palestinian people and indigenous here also with the genocide that happened here and also the current assimilation process that is still our brothers and sisters here are, are facing every day, you know, they're being custody, you know, the racism that you have here. I can get a job here, I'm an anthropologist, I get a job, but my brothers and sisters cannot get it. What's the difference? I'm an indigenous person. Like them, we have very similar culture, we are very spiritual people, similar beliefs, that our connection with the land is the same. So what's the difference? That's what people need to ask, you know? So yes, we feel that we will continue fighting. Mm -hmm. We will continue uh, not letting the government to assimilate us. We have over 60 people, 60 leaders in our communities in jail at the moment, waiting for a, a legal process because that's what they do. They punish us with the anti-terrorist law. <clears throat> so the anti-terrorist law allow you to keep, allow them to keep us in jail without a clear accusation. It means that they investigate. Yeah? So we had one important leader last week. He was the first one to receive a sentence. 35 years plus one day doing nothing just to protect our land, our territory. So that, yeah, this is the way they work. So I hope I answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, or Gabi Melamaniel, which is the word for greetings in my language. I'm Jasper Cohen Hunter, and I'm the traditional owner, original custodian of the Wiradjuri Wurundjeri people. Uh, my clan is Gunnawil and Bullock, uh, which is the clan of my grandfather, Lord Hunter. Um, so, yeah, what does it mean to be an original custodian of this land in a place that, that's the city, right? It's concrete. We, just like the, um, Forgotten, just like the people that are original custodians of all major cities um, in this country, what does environmental number mean to us? Because we were at the frontier um, of the destruction of our environment. You know, there's no such thing as a sacred land and sacred sites when um, there's concrete and skyscrapers, whatever. Um, I've tried my best for today to write down some, some major events that occurred uh, on frontier conflicts here, particularly in the 1840s. <laughs> Uh, in, in this city in particular, but the fact that our unified nation being the Woiwurrung speaking languages um, and the larger Kulin nation, um, when they first met the Port Phillip Association led by John Batman, um, as well as Faulkner, um, the two men that are considered the founding fathers, I suppose, um, of the colonial project of Melbourne, there was a, uh, a phony treaty that was signed um, they called it a treaty, but it was void under international uh, and United Kingdom law. Um, under the Crown, it was illegal and it was also illegal under the current colony uh, of New South Wales. It was a treaty that had signed off uh, the land of Geelong as well as Melbourne um, through language barriers that were completely unheard of, except for the fact that there was a convict that fell off a boat uh, that was a translator with them called William Buckley, um, which attempted to try and figure out between both parties uh, what was going on. Under our traditional law, people through ceremony or tanderum have the right to access and walk through country um, through smoking and ceremony and dance, uh, where knowledge uh, is shared, where trading um, and, and law is, is uh, given between different groups. And so my understanding, particularly with the Narangeta or the leader at the time, a man called Billabaleri, who was a songman, um, who was the person that led 
um, the delegated parties to the Port Phillip Association. What I think was going through his head at the time with the Namaji or the white people that came to this country was that they thought that this was a rite of passage for them to go further. Because at the time, um, we're going to look at this continent as a timeline. Neighbouring tribes um, from the UN nation were already seeing from 1770 um, that the the boat um, from Captain Cook was sailing up the coastline. This would have been um, translated through to the Bidwell, to the Gunai, to the Kurnai, um, and then to us and the Kulin nation as well. On top of this, um, Portland or the land of the Gunditj Mara, um, if you're familiar with the fighting Gunditj Mara who fought frontier wars against the colonists at the time, um, would have notified my mob that there were people that didn't look like us that were on the frontier that were shooting us with guns that we'd never seen before when all we had was parrying shields and spears. And so on top of this, there was a failed, um, it's funny that it failed, there was a failed uh, settlement in Sorrento. And so this was the first time um, in the general region that a colonial outpost had been established. They couldn't find water. So they'd failed and they went back to Van Diemen's land um, and continued the killing times, the Black Wars, uh, the Frontier Wars, whatever you want to call them down there. There's a few names that they refer to it as. Um, it was very early during this time that the settlers had gone through the Yarra River or the Birrung uh, in 1835 and had noticed that they hit a waterfall uh, in today where the CBD is. And it was made of uh, a basalt outcrop and it was about one metre high uh, and it had the ability for the natives to cross from one side to the other. When you think about um, how people cross a river without a canoe, um, there's two major sites uh, on the Yarra River, one of them being Dites Falls, which is sort of just around these areas. Um, and the other one was where Queen's Bridge is today. And so down um, the line of colonization, when we had been um, pushed to the brinks to where King's Domain, Camp Sovereignty, uh, where the Botanic Gardens is today, where the first mission school was established, um, the settlers had realized in 35 that they couldn't get any further by their boats. So they decided that the only thing to do was to blow it up with dynamite. So there was used to be a waterfall in the CBD that separated uh, drinking water, fresh water on the right uh, to seawater on the left. And so this was a safe passage, but it was also drinking water um, and fresh water that you could catch eels in. You see, around the 1880s, there was a large reconstruction of the city. And in particular with the Yarra Fall demo demolition, um, the waterways that were sacred in that area was completely destroyed and rerouted um, in order to create factories um, and working sites from the colonists. So one thing that people might not know is that from the Maribyrnong Creek um, or the Maribyrnong River to the Yarra River is a creek um, that flows underneath Elizabeth Street. And it was in the 1880s that the colonists decided that instead of having the creek uh, that flowed between both rivers that they were going to pipe it and turn it into a storm drain. So every 50 or so years, uh, we have a major flooding incident that occurs on Elizabeth Street and people wonder where does the water come from? And it's because it's from the water cycle because that area was a floodplain. It's a swampland um, and flooding was a part of what we did. That's how we utilised the land. When the river had uh, flooded, the catchment of the uh, river would go into a billab billabong um, where the Botanic Gardens is today, which you might be familiar with, uh, which was where the eels would flow in from the river by Maribyrnong Creek to Williams Creek um, to the Yarra River. And then it would flow and flood uh, into where the Botanic Gardens is today. And this was all a connected system. But because the entire area was rerouted, this system was completely destroyed, cutting us off from our food. Um, the natural systems to catch eels, which was during March. So March every year was the was the eel season. Um, the, the eels would come through and then we would collect them with other clay pots or um, woven baskets. And then um, that's how we would get our food and sustenance, particularly protein during that time. And so a lot of our systems that we had were completely destroyed during that early frontier because we had been completely driven off to the sidelines. And so we had been kept into these um, mission complexes on where pretty much South Bank is today um, in a mission school and then further um, put 
to the side and pushed further and further up to Hillsville over the first hundred years, actually the first 70 years of colonization of this land um, where they completely changed everything. And so people want to know why the Yarra River is so brown. Why does it stink? Why does it look so ugly? Why can't we swim in it? And it's because 200 years ago, they blew it up with dynamite and the sediment from the banks uh, and from the bottom of the river was blown up by the colonists because they wanted to get their boats further. So that's, the, I guess that's the first thing that I wanted to talk about that I put my notes in, but that's an important thing to understand the context of the destruction of this land, because to everyone, it's just a city, but it used to be a sacred hunting spot. It used to be uh, fruitful for areas that we would get so much of our food um, and our re resources from, and that is just no longer possible. So, and that's because it's, it's Melbourne. So yeah, there we go. Um, thank you. The people that are standing there, there's places here in the front you can sit down. There's one more chair there. I hate for you to be suffering throughout this session standing. So come, come forward. We honestly are peaceful people. <laughs> so yes, please. You can, there's pillows here. You can sit down. Um, thank you. Uh, so first, I have to apologize about being late. Um, I've been in this continent of yours now three and a half weeks, gave something like uh, 80 some official talks like this one, plus a number of other events. Uh, was never late for any one of them. So <laughs> this is a first for me. So I apologize for that. Uh, but this tour in Australia and then what's so-called Australia and then New Zealand and then I'm back to Bethlehem. So you asked me to speak about my background briefly. I was born in the shepherd's field where the shepherds heard the angels tell them that Jesus was born just up the hill. Uh, so my ancestors are those shepherds and my family has been connected to the land for thousands of years. From the time our ancestors were actually the ones who uh, traveled first out of Africa, as you know, uh, the human populations around the world were, were populated from people who came from East Africa. But how did they come from East Africa to be in places like Chile or Palestine or anywhere else? They came through Palestine first, because that was the land bridge between Eurasia and Africa. So even Aboriginal people in in this continent, your ancestors are Palestinians. I don't know if you want to know this or not. You, <laughs> uh, or came from that part of the world. So we have a common heritage, a common history as humanity, uh, originating and populating this earth. But there is something called indigenous people. What does that mean? What is the definition of indigenous people? It's the first people, that's why they call them first people, to settle a particular piece of this planet Earth and to evolve, to evolve contemporaneously with the evolution of the climate and the weather and the habitat and the fauna and flora around them, right? And so we become adapted to those habitats. That is why you find uh, also even features of people change depending on where they have lived for thousands of years. Because there is natural selection for features that are adaptable with the local climate and with the local fauna and flora. That's the definition of indigeneity of indigenous people according to archeologists, anthropologists, and other people. Uh, what is colonization also? We have to define it. Colonization is an idea. It's a concept. It doesn't come out of nowhere. There's a concept. The concept is we go to a land that has had people there who evolved different languages and different habits and different ways of hunting and different ways of farming and all of these things. And we want to create a new reality very quickly when we were talking about, for example, indigenous people in this country over 70,000 years ago, that's a long time of evolution of human and nature together. Or in Palestine, it's even longer than that, 110,000 years ago is when humans first migrated out of Africa to our region. And you see this 
and you say, hey, nice habitats, nice diversity, nice people with various languages and cultures and habits, and we don't like it. We want to change it to become a mini Europe. Hence, they name things like in the US, New England, New London, New York. Uh, we want to both create something new, but the York part of it is still there. It's what we, we were used to, that climate, that habits, that livelihood. And we want to create something similar to that here in this continent or in Palestine or anywhere else. And this is not in Chile, you know. What, what, is, what is that about? Well, it's about, you know, financial benefit, greed, whatever. You can study now. There's a whole body of literature on colonialism. I mean, just behind me, I was looking at some of those books. There's some books here related to that if you want to learn more about colonialism. But what is my, my own family background is we are Canaanitic people. And we know that that's a term first used for our people because it came around the time of the invention of writing 5,000 years ago. So they wrote about themselves that we are the people of the land of Canaan or Canaanit. This is who we are. Now, before that, 10,000, 20,000 years ago, we don't know what they called themselves because it's only no written record. But in the written record, it's very clear. Archaeological record helps us. For example, archaeologists discovered that the first agriculture on this planet Earth happened in our region, what's called the Fertile Crescent, you know, where humans first domesticated wild animals and wild plants. Wild plants like olives, figs, almonds, uh, you know, things like that, but also things like, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> lentils, wheat, barley. You wouldn't have beer without us. Uh, <laughs> and you wouldn't have bread without us, our ancestors who developed these technologies of domestication of wild plants and animals. Animals like goats and sheep and uh, donkeys and camels. That's in the Fertile Crescent. Hence, a fertile crescent, by the way, when people domesticated these plants and animals, they have a stable source of food. So their numbers increased. They were able to establish city-states, and they were able to have something we today call, quote-unquote, civilization. I say, quote-unquote, because I'm not sure we humans are fully civilized yet. Uh, we have a long way to go to be truly civilized. One time... Somebody asked Mahatma Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, well, I think it will be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reality. So here's where we are. My ancestors are those people. Now, where are they now? My family is dispersed in at least 20 countries. 20 countries, including in Chile. You find the whole Kumsiya clans in Chile. <laughs> and here in Australia, I met many Palestinians. One of them turned out to be a distant relative of mine on my mother's side. We are dispersed. Why? How did this happen? <laughs> well, it's not a secret, you know. It's not like they tried to hide it. There are 15 million Palestinians in the world. Eight million of us are refugees or displaced people. This was not an act of God or a natural disaster. It was obvious. We are, in a couple of days, we will have a commemoration of the Nakba traditionally done on 15 May. I don't want you to be mistaken and think that the Nakba is one day. No, the Nakba has been happening to us before 15 May 1948, from the 1920s under British rule. Throughout that period before May 1948, when the State of Israel was created, and after the State of Israel was created in 1948, people talk about the genocide now. But there was genocide before. My mother's best friend in school 
was a woman by the, a girl at the time. They were both, my mother was 16 or 17, and this girl was 18 years old. Her name is Hana, ha, Haya Balbisi. Haya Balbisi was from Dar Yassin. She went back to Dar Yassin during the conflict. They were both, she and my mother were friends at the teacher's college in Jerusalem. And they were both teachers. They used to allow teachers to start at as early as 15. So Haya Balbisi went to Dar Yassin and she was massacred, butchered with her students, with her young students from five years old to 11 years old at this village of Dar Yassin. And Dar Yassin was not the largest massacre. Tantura and other places were larger. And there were dozens of massacres, dozens, literally, in, in from starting from January 1948 until December 1949, when the ceasefire lines were drawn, so-called ceasefire lines. So. And that's, that's happened in 1940. They used even chemical weapons then. So there was genocide. It was incremental, not as devastating as what we see now. But also what we see now is something that we can see. In the past, there was no mobile phones that people could record themselves being butchered and killed, you know? And genocides are not are not uh, you, you know, unique to Palestine or anything. I don't want you to think we are any, speci any more special than the genocide that happened here. You are familiar with that, right? Or the genocide that happened in Chile and the disappeared people in South America, all because of the US policy. And by the way, Israel was a big supporter of that, funded people like Pinochet and others, and and, I supplied them with training to their military of how to do torture, how to do executions, how to do disappearances. This is, I wrote a, a, a research about this, by the way, the relationship of, uh, of Israel with South America. And my next trip will be to South America. So anyways, what, what I think we need to realize is this is a common phenomenon. Why is it common? And so when some people talk about similarities between what happened to us, what's happening to us now in Palestine, what happened to Native Americans, for example, indigenous people in North America, or South Africa with the Zulus, Zulu massacres by the Dutch and, and British colonizers. There are similarities, yes, but why is there similarities? It's because the perpetrators are one and the same. With, with one and the same mentality, which you both spoke about, the ideas. The ideas are the same. The ideas are what is the indigenous people to them? What's the First Nations to them? They're, they're not even to be considered. They are like stones in a road that you are passing by. You move them to the side or you kill them if they are plants. You uproot them so that you can build that road. They are objects, basically. They are dehumanized to a point where it doesn't matter whether you kill them, butcher them. Sometimes you give them choices. You can be killed or you can convert to our way of thinking, become a colonizer yourself. That's what I call mental colonization. Or you can just go away, find yourself another country. This is, this is uh, to them, it doesn't really matter which choice you make. Because you are just an obstacle. You are just a, a nuisance, if you want. And this is what happened in our country. It's what happened in just about every single country on Earth. There's not a single country on Earth that was not a colonizer or colonized in history. I challenge you to find me one. All of them. Europe, for example, Switzerland. Why is Switzerland, the south of Switzerland, speaks uh, Italian? Because they were colonized by the Romans, you know? So <laughs> the Eng England, which became a, the largest, maybe not the largest, maybe Spain is the largest colonizing country on earth. But, uh, but even Spain, Spain was colonized by the Moors, you know, people from North Africa for a while. And, uh, and then they became colonizers. And England was colonized by the Romans, and then they became colonizers. 
So that even now, as we destroyed this beautiful planet of us, of ours, there are people who are talking about colonizing Mars, right? Colonizing Mars. I hope there's no living forms on Mars that are going to be impacted by this colonization. So it is there. And my family story is not any different than dozens of uh, millions of people around the world that have stories to tell. On a personal level, just to tell you, I lived in the United States for many years. I felt guilty because I was like partaking of the privileges that the so-called United States was created on the massacre and destruction of so many nations. And I eventually moved back to Palestine in 2008, also to, to be closer to my homeland and to resist. And I was arrested many times for my resistance. We were challenged, we were attacked, both in the US and in my country. I wrote a book, I ended up writing a book about popular resistance in Palestine, subtitled A History of Hope and Empowerment, which is the last thing I wanna say. Uh, or actually, you asked me about the environmental impact, so I should quickly say something about the environment. Sorry. Uh, being being from the shepherd's field, by the way, there is a, a story about us because we went up to Bethlehem, saw Jesus was born, and what were we told to do? Go tell the world. So the story about us is that you cannot shut us up. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, in the environment, we write research papers, books about the subject. You can go on our website and read about them. The environmental destruction in Palestine, the ecocide, which is the right word to use for it, an ecocide, is probably more damaging than the genocide that is happening. I don't exaggerate, because it will leave its imprint and will kill far more people in the next few generations than the genocide. I don't have time to go through it, but you can go on our website, palestinenature.org, and read about it how Israel has destroyed the Jordan River Basin, how Israel had drained the wetlands of the area, just like you said about the river here, how they changed courses of rivers, how they uh, destroyed the ecology, how so many hundreds of species disappeared because of Israeli colonial actions in our country, how the bombing of Gaza alone produced more greenhouse gases than many countries produced in a whole year, and that's not even from the bombs exploding. It's just from the jet fuel that these airplanes use. The Guardian newspaper had one article. They estimated that the amount of greenhouse gases emitted by the 254,000 sorties jet flights over the first 60 days was more than what Central African Republic as a whole country produced in greenhouse gases. So you can see the impact of wars. The military is the largest producer of greenhouse gases. Wars and conflict and destruction of indigenous people is not just a cost to us, the indigenous people. It's a cost to our environment. It's to a cost to the whole planet. And we cannot afford it anymore in this modern era. That's why this genocide of Palestinians I am optimistic, must be the last genocide of the thousands of genocides before it must be the last genocide because it is leading to a regional war and it's going to lead to a global war. Unless we stop it and we have real respect for indigenous people globally, not just in Palestine. That's why I said that the rally, those of you who are in the rally, I said decolonize globally, not just in one area, decolonize globally. Unless we do that, we're all going to go extinct. There's not going to be winners and losers in the next world war. It's going to be all losers. Doesn't matter, China, Russia, Amer America, whatever. They're all going to, be, all humanity will be losers. That is why I think it's urgent, and I'm glad you show up and uh, overbook the room and people online. It shows you are interested and you want to do something, and I encourage you to do something. Thank you. Sorry I took a while. That's
We're going to be hearing from people online next. Wow. Can, they, can we make that happen? Awesome. So we have two speakers online. Um, we have Mina and Abir. Can you hear us? Yes, I hear you. We can hear you as well. You as well. But I didn't get your question because I there was a technical problem earlier. So I don't hear you now. Apologies. <laughs> okay, I hear. Okay, now I hear you. About now. Yes, I hear you. Yes. Let me say the question and we'll move. Yeah. Okay. First of all, if you can please take a couple of minutes to just introduce yourself uh, in the way that you like to. And then um, we are talking about uh, environmental Nakba, as you know. Um, I would like to ask what the concept of environmental Nakba or ecocide mean to you? And then what are the most prominent ways that colonization has affected the sovereign lands that you are on? Wow, well, that, that, that's really a very deep question. And first, allow me to express my thanks very much to Friends of the Earth and also to uh, the panel members. It's really indeed an honor. My name is uh, Mina Rahman from Malaysia. I'm uh, currently the president of um, Friends of the Earth uh, Malaysia, Tambadala Malaysia. Um, well, where do I start? Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of uh, Malaysia. I myself come because I come, came to this country primarily through um, colonization, actually, because my ancestors uh, were, are, were actually um, in India, uh, from South India and uh, my great grandparents and my uh, grandparents came from India um, and they were brought over by the British to work in the plantations, the rubber plantations in Malaya at that time and uh, by the British um, colonialists. And uh, what really happened then was um, um, that that's our history. And I was born in this country of uh, Malaysia now and uh, we are a minority of the population. Of course, um, the British were, came and occupied our lands and prior to them were the Portuguese and uh, our people, the, or the first uh, people here were of course the indigenous peoples of Malaya and also East Malaysia and um, Friends of the Earth, uh, Malaysia is um, fighting, I mean, in struggle with them because until today, despite the fact that we are independent we still have a huge um, uh, fight over uh, to defend the land rights of indigenous peoples here and also the rainforest and biodiversity and so on, primarily because we have um, um, taken on the British legal system, which then made uh, um, you know, land in the hands of the crown and then now it lands in the hands of the, of the sovereign state. Um, but I think today when we are talking about the environmental catastrophe that's happening, and I'm really happy to have heard Professor Mazin and also very honored to meet the Mapuche people uh, when I was at a meeting in London recently. Um, and so all I wanted to say was that uh, our struggles are, of course, I mean, different. Um, you know, I'm we are privileged. A lot of us are privileged um, to be here. And also the connections that you have, and I totally agree with, with what Professor Mazin said, that um, many the, the real reason of colonialism was really about um, our um, minerals, our natural resources. And this is why the colonial settlers came and occupied our countries. And, um, and we have the East, uh, the British East India Company come um, to take away our resources, whether they were minerals, whether they were tin, whether they were rubber and so on and so forth. 
um, that was um, all over the world, as, as we know, in the Global South, um, for their industry and for their um, um, rev industrial revolution, as they call it, um, industrialization then. And then with the emissions that they had created, also generated, which is the historical emissions that they have become rich now because of the history of colonialism. So there's no way that any of our fight for social justice or environmental justice or climate justice um, can be disconnected from decolon uh, decolonization, um, despite the independence that many of our countries had obtained, our systems of um, finance, trade, economy, production, and consumption are deeply, deeply um, uh, rooted in colonial history. So in order to have uh, real freedom, this is why those of us in Friends of the Earth and including Friends of the Earth International pay a lot of attention to the, the, to the aspect of colon, uh, decolonializing, decolon not just our lands and our systems, but also our minds. I think the deepest, deepest decolonization uh, is the colon, colon, colonialism of the mind, where our education system were actually replaced, indigenous peoples, indigenous cultures, our traditions and many of our traditions also have been displaced and replaced with Western civilization, which uh, as Gandhi said was a good idea, but actually it was a bad idea. And uh, to the extent that in order for us to really stand up and fight for our rights in all our struggles, we have to see the, the context right from the colonial history. And so for climate justice activists and environmental activists, and for the, the eco side that we see around the world today, and uh, for many of us, we, we, are, we are in the front line of the climate justice battle internationally. We can speak more about that later. But there is no way to, to um, really attain true justice without the freedom of um, our lands, our minds, our souls from the, col the, the colonial history. And so many of us actually are making the connections and, um, and in the Palestinian struggle, most of all, I think what we see and the pain that, that, that many of us go through, um, just to say that um, many of us were last year in, at the COP28 in uh, Dubai, we stood together with um, all of civil society together um, in, in solidarity with the Palestinian peoples and end a call for an end for to settler colonialism, because until Palestine is free, none of us are free in this world. So our our um, colonial histories are united. Our struggle for freedom is united. And and at this point in time, I don't know whether I'm answering your question, but only to show that all aspects of environmental struggles and the kind of um, um, systems, the production system and the consumption system that we are living under, unless we take a very deep, um, uh, unless we have a deep systemic understanding from the British East India Company to the corporate colonialism, which is now in, in through capitalism, and in fact, imperialism, we are not going to be able to uh, get the real kind of ju social justice, environmental justice, and climate justice that we need. I think I'll end here um, and, and uh, just wanted to say how deeply um, um, honored I am to be part of this uh, panel and particularly to hear uh, the panel members. Hello. Abir, can you hear us? Hello, yes. Hi, Bibi. Go for it. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. Hi, welcome. We can all hear you, so please go ahead when you're ready. I'm ready. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Abir Butme, the coordinator of uh, Penguin Friends of the Earth uh, Palestine. Uh, I work as a coordinator for uh, environmental uh, lobby and advocacy campaigns uh, in Palestine, in West Bank and Gaza uh, Strip. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Friends of the Earth Australia for uh, this important uh, webinar. Uh, within uh, this uh, very hard situation, we live um, in West Bank and also in Gaza uh, Strip. Uh, I would like to uh, focus more on the current situation and the work of uh, Bingon under uh, uh, this uh, hard situation. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, we are devastated to inform you that uh, during uh, this war against Gaza, uh, since the 7th of October, uh, seven uh, colleagues uh, were passed away uh, as a result of uh, the Israeli attack um, during um, their suffering and displacement from one place uh, to another place, uh, finding uh, a safe uh, a safe place in Gaza Strip, if there is a safe place in Gaza Strip. Uh, these uh, seven um, uh, colleagues uh, from uh, Bingo members in Gaza uh, Strip, uh, I would like to, um, to mention their uh, names. Um, Sorry, uh, the first one is uh, uh, Asma, uh, sorry, uh, Islam uh, Ali. Uh, she, uh, she was attacked during uh, uh, looking for uh, a safer place uh, inside Gaza, uh, Gaza City. Um, uh, Ahmed Jnene uh, from uh, Palestinian Hydrology uh, Group. And uh, uh, Firas uh, Abu Mahsan, uh, Bilal Msallam, uh, Wala uh, Saade, uh, Muhammad uh, Zakzuk, and uh, Shayma uh, Mansour. Uh, so these uh, seven um, uh, colleagues were passed away as a result of the uh, Israeli uh, attack uh, against uh, Gaza, uh, lifting their uh, families, um, in addition to uh, hundreds of uh, relatives from our um, um, member groups inside inside Gaza uh, Strip, uh, were um, uh, were killed as a result of the Israeli uh, attacks. In addition to uh, hundreds of uh, prisoners uh, inside Gaza Strip, uh, so. Um, Within uh, since the beginning of uh, the war uh, against Gaza, up to 1.7 million people, uh, over 75% uh, of population, uh, and more than half of them are children, have been displaced across across the Gaza Strip. Uh, the majority uh, multiple times. Um, uh, families are uh, forced to move repeatedly in search of uh, safety, uh, but, the, but the reality, there is no uh, safe place in Gaza. Uh, our colleagues in Bingham members in Gaza have uh, been displaced more than nine times. Uh, our offices uh, in Gaza, they're uh, completely uh, were damaged uh, by the Israeli um, attacks. Um, in the beginning of uh, the war, they, the uh, Bingon members staff, uh, they were displaced from their homes. Uh, currently, they uh, moving, carrying their tents, looking for another destination, but they don't know where to go. Uh, because uh, in the beginning, um, uh, they moved from the northern part to Rafah. Now uh, the Israeli attack also uh, target uh, Rafah, and now the situation in Rafah is the worst uh, is the worst place uh, currently. Um, 
Uh, since the beginning of the war, uh, since the 7th of October, more than uh, 6,000 uh, Palestinians in West Bank and inside 48 land uh, are in the Israeli prisons, uh, living the worst situation ever, without food, without clothes, uh, with a, a very hard um, uh, situation inside the prisons. Uh, the total number of the uh, uh, of the arrests among women uh, was more than 200, and the number of uh, arrests among um, uh, children uh, reached more than 400 uh, children. Uh, uh, during this uh, this war, the, uh, also the environmental activists and the uh, journalists uh, were targeted by the Israeli uh, attack. Uh, more than 130 uh, journalists uh, were killed during this uh, war, and more than uh, 50 journalists uh, were arrested uh, in the Israeli uh, jail. Uh, so, um, regarding the uh, current situation inside Gaza uh, Strip, uh, even this hard situation in Gaza Strip, our colleagues and in our in Bingo members, they continue um, trying to uh, uh, to uh, apply uh, or to um, present their ser the services that uh, they can do. Uh, they uh, do the best that uh, they can do in order to provide the people uh, in different uh, areas in Gaza Strip with the urgent needs, uh, with vegetables, foods, uh, uh, water, uh, and uh, hygiene uh, kits. Uh, even uh, a very hard situation, they uh, leave their uh, their families and go to uh, supply uh, people with the uh, urgent uh, needs in different uh, areas and governorates in Gaza uh, Strip. Um, and regarding the uh, situation in West Bank, it is uh the worst uh, ever also we we've lived um all the entrances of the uh, cities were closed uh, as a result of the israeli control uh, so we have to uh, move round and round to find another uh, way to reach uh, our areas um, uh, for example uh, for me personally uh, i have to uh, travel uh, daily from the north to the uh, middle of uh, West Bank, uh, and sometimes the, um, the my way takes more than um, four hours to reach uh, my uh, office, and uh, also that affects uh, uh, on uh, our work on on the daily and monthly work because uh, when we go to when we when we wanna go to the. Uh, affected areas to so the marginalized areas which are which are mainly in area uh, c which is uh, under the israeli uh, control uh, we cannot uh, reach these areas uh, as a result of the uh, israeli restrictions whether the israeli uh, soldiers or also the uh, settlers uh, threat uh, so um, uh, the uh, israeli uh, settlers uh, threat are uh, accelerating since the beginning of uh, the war uh, many uh, cases uh, that happened that uh, the Israeli uh, settlers attacked the Palestinian villages and the Palestinian farmers inside their uh, their lands and um, they prevented the, uh, them to reach their land. So um, in area C, the majority of the farmers, they uh, couldn't reach the, their land to rehabilitate their land or plant their land as a result of uh, the uh, Israeli uh, threats, whether the Israeli soldiers or the uh, Israeli uh, settlers. And uh, related also to uh, Pingon uh, work uh, in order to providing the marginalized communities with uh, with the, the main uh, basic, uh, uh, for example, wash development uh, facilities like uh, water tanks uh, or pumps, we can we couldn't reach uh, the marginalized communities as a result of the uh, Israeli policies of pre preventing the uh, Palestinian organizations from doing their uh, their work. And in addition to uh, threaten the um, uh, Palestinian environmental activists and who human rights activists uh, with the uh, um, uh, Israeli uh, prisons. Uh, so um, uh, 
uh, even this hard situation, we uh, try to do uh, our best in order to uh, to reach uh, the uh, marginalized areas, even if we uh, have to uh to to stay more than um, uh, half of the day in the in in in, our, in the way for to reach the to the to reach the agricultural uh, land uh we are trying to uh, support the Palestinian farmers um uh, uh, with the main uh, needs in order to increase their steadfastness in their land, even uh, the Israeli um, uh, huge uh, pressure on the Palestinian farmers to, re to leave their land. Um, uh, the last uh, the last point I want to mention that uh, since the beginning of the war, uh, the Israeli uh, occupation, uh, they uh, take the, this chance in order to increase the expansion of the settlements. They started working on uh, building uh, new settlements in different areas in West Bank, uh, and they follow uh, the strategy of um, uh, establishing uh, small barracks for the Israeli shepherd, uh, and uh, then establish uh, solar uh, energy uh, projects in order to provide this uh, barracks with uh, electricity, and then with uh, water, uh, then uh, this is this will be a starting point for, for a new settlement. So, um, during or since the beginning of the war, we noticed that uh, different areas in Area C, uh, the Israeli occupation established uh, many of uh, these uh, barracks uh, for Israeli shepherds to prevent the Palestinians, far the Palestinian farmers, to reach uh, their land and to put control on uh, this land uh, and to uh, be the uh, first step for a new settlement in these areas. Uh, so, um, uh, within this uh, very bad uh, situation in West Bank, uh, we are trying to uh, keep working on supplying the farmers what we can do and what they can do. And uh, in Gaza uh, Strip, we continue uh, supplying uh, uh, our people in Gaza with the urgent uh, needs as uh, uh, the amount of uh, uh, of 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 the remaining food or of the hygiene uh, uh, equipments and uh, materials, uh, even uh, currently after uh, controlling Rafah uh, uh, Rafah border, uh, the amount of uh, of these materials are very limited uh, to all of uh, Gaza Strip. Thank you very much. not gonna it's great amazing it's a little bit hard to follow that so i'm just gonna try my best but you know i think we're all feeling the weight of of what we've just heard just wanted to say how much it's how much of an honor it is to be able to have all of you here and also have mina and abir um talking to us from afar um, specifically to Abir, um, we know how dangerous it is for you to actually be able to be saying these things um, on an open webinar platform and we hope that you are staying safe and we're here for you for whatever, whatever happens. We know it's absolutely um, very risky to be speaking out against the Israeli occupation while you're in the West Bank. So what we've heard from all of our speakers is that there is a common theme along environmental Nakba, catastrophe, genocide, and it seems like even though we've all come from very different places around the world, there is really one root cause to all of this and it's colonization. The Nakba is not just a one-time event that happened, it is ongoing. It happens day after day after day. We've heard that from all of our speakers. 
It comes from colonization and imperialism, and we've heard it a few times, extractivism. It's because of resources, whether that be minerals, fuel, um, whatever it is that they need. We've seen it everywhere around the world that colonial entities will enter and take what they will and then leave a, an intense amount of destruction. This extends beyond um, the catastrophe of today. Um, the, the concept of, of uh, environmental, um, of Nakba, is that um, it will affect many, many more generations to come. The climate movement has been a very white space for a really long time. And I'm really, really happy to finally see it get properly decolonized. You can't have, we've heard it from a lot of people, you can't have environmental justice without liberation, without land back, without properly and deeply decolonizing our minds. I wanted to mention, I didn't actually introduce myself at the beginning, but <laughs> um, yeah, I, I grew up in Syria. I've got heritage in Jordan and Palestine and Armenia. Um, but on the concept of, of um, yeah, of ecocide. Um, I went back to Syria last year after 10 years away and I noticed that most people were just starting to develop some sort of a respiratory illness. Um, it's been, you know, the, the war started 10 years ago. Probably the last time that chemical weapons was used was in 2018 there. And my grandmother just started to develop asthma. Everywhere you, you look around you, there is just an intense amount of disease everywhere that is chronic, that is ongoing, that will take generations to, to, to get rid of that. So even though they're rebuilding or showing, showing to the world that they're rebuilding, um, the, the, the effect of that is done. They were hitting Damascus with chemical weapons when I was there and I developed asthma. I don't know if it's because of that or not, but this is ongoing right now in South Lebanon, there's phosphorus being dropped on the lands that's going to pollute the soil for a very, very long time. War doesn't just have a cost on human life. It has a cost on, on generations to come and, and not only in diseases, but also in our ability, in people's ability to, to grow food, which is our main source of connection to land and our main source of income for a lot of people in these lands. I wanted to move to militarization. This is something that a lot of the speakers talked about. I had actually another question, but we're gonna we're gonna go with this, I think. Um, we are on this continent. We are in Australia. There's only so much that we can do. We know, I hope by now, that Australia is complicit in this genocide and many other genocides like in West Papua and like in other places in the world. I wanted to ask any of the speakers, whoever feels uh, like you would like to answer, is what can we do here now to be starting the solution? I mean, it's a bit hard to sit and talk about like take, tearing down the entire US imperialist state, but that is the goal. What? Uh, what can we <laughs> what do you think we can do here as as people who are living on stolen lands to demilitarize our communities and to yeah to to take funds away from the powers that are killing people all over the world. So I'll leave it open to whoever would like to answer. And maybe try and cap it to five minutes each, um, just because we're running <laughs> quite late. Yeah, cool. Um, a very difficult question, yeah. Um, My community, as I mentioned before, it has been so long 
protecting our territory, our land. And we have been using different ways to do it, different ways to organize. And as you said before, it's not much what you can say when you are in a public space because they are always listening. There is always people, you know, uh, that work with them, trying to pay attention in what you said because they know you are campaigning always, you know, to denounce what they are doing. And so it's, but yeah, look, Mapuche people will not stop protecting, you know, our territory. They had been using different ways, as I mentioned before, the militarization. Before it was a very normal or formal militarization. Now they double the militarization. They they had been using the anti-terrorist law against any Mapuche. Now they are using the anti-terrorist law, but at the same time now they are saying that we are part of the drug cartel. So now Mapuche people are also involved in drag, planting and selling. So there are always, you know, we, we are talking about at the moment after all what I mentioned early, Mapuche people, we have a, approximately 450 hectares that in the Chilean constitutions are still indigenous sort of land, yeah? But from those 450 hectares, there is 250, thousand and the forestry companies. How they got our land? Yeah, that's a good question, yeah? So with the displacement, with the militarization, all the different ways they use as a way to push us out of, out of our land. They try for a while to convince us that yes, we can still be Mapuche without land because you know our name means Mapuche, means people of the land. Yeah, land, Mapu, Che, people. But they try to convince that, no, no, you can live in the cities. You still will be Mapuche. You know, they got an agreement between the first Chilean people who called themselves Chileans after the independence in Chile. They decide that they will assimilate Mapuches or if they have to disappear, why not? As a way to create a good national unity. That, that's, that's the way they see us. So how we survive? Because we have a lot of people like you who come here to listen. We, we do have Chilean people, Argentinian people who are helping our people in areas that we don't know what to do. But also we are very grateful with some governments, you know, Cuba, they opened the door to Mapuche people to go and study. We could study for free then. So our people, we have doctors, we have historians, you know, thanks to the Cuban government, because they not just uh, allow our people to study for free, also, you know, solidarity make them to travel and go there. So you know what I mean? So we need to reinvent ourselves over and over. You know, that's what we do. We find ways. Now we are in a process where our young indigenous people who grow up in the main cities, where their ancestors has been displaced a hundred years ago, feeling so proud to be Mapuches, and they are teaching themselves our language, that is Mapudungun, again, Mapu, yeah, as I explained before, is land, Dungun language, the language of the land. So they are learning themselves. They are trying to play our, you know, um, the sport that we play in the communities. You know, they are learning our culture. They are learning our spirituality and they are trying to do that in the main city. And we have some of them who are hip hop or rap, -hip, you know, they play music they write music in Mapudungun and they, they never grow up in our communities. We call communities, the Mapuche is the one we live or we grow up in our territory. Because remember, we were invaded, displaced, but the ones managed to stay in our land, they divide us into communities as a way to assimilate us. Because if you divide, you conquest, yeah? 
conquest to the, I don't know, I'm not sure the order. <laughs> so, but they didn't, <laughs> they couldn't do it. So the, the connection that we have with the land, our spirituality is bigger than whatever they are trying to do. We are not going to stop. And I'm sure they are listening and it's good for them to listen that we are not gonna stop. My people back home is not going to stop moving back into our territory. They can displace us over and over, but we will keep repeating the same, moving back today, get displaced tomorrow, moving back into the land the day after, and over and over. That's why we have so many indigenous in jail at the moment, because that's what we do. And I don't think the new generations, the way I see them, they are going to stop doing it. And also the international solidarity, you know, is helping us. People denouncing what's happening to us is helping us. You know, one email, you forward whatever you receive about this is happening to Mapuche indigenous people is really help community. So yes, it's important to continue the struggle, you know? Thank you. I'm gonna try my best to answer this question. Um, and I think when I say this, I'm gonna speak for myself and myself only and not the Wurundjeri nation um, because I tend to be a bit of a black sheep from the, from the herd. Um, the first death in custody in this country was at the hands of the Wurundjeri because the Wurundjeri were native police and the native police were a paramilitary group uh, of a dozen to, to 20 Aboriginal people and their entire position in the frontier wars was to use their tracking skills to murder other Aboriginal people. Now, from anywhere to the occupied uh, Gunai, Kurnai nations, to the Gundachmara, uh, up to the north, to the Tanaral, the people that were the compradors that murdered their own people, murdered their own family in Melbourne, to Geelong, to all the massacres, were the Wurundjeri. Now, I have a belief that if that happened over 200 years ago, that those same people exist here today in our society and that they're the ones that are selling off our land. And so when you see that perhaps it's native title land um, that's been sold off to a mining company or it's beautiful sacred land right here in a place called Kurakura Cup that is being sold off right now to real estate developers, you'll come to find that native police are everywhere. Um, and we might call that normalization. We might call that uh, collaborators traders or just native police, mission dogs. We've got a lot of names for them. We have beautiful sacred land uh, that I spent my, my evening last night walking around at. And we've got some fighters. We've got some people that are doing traditional burning on country and they're keeping it um, healthy and they're keeping it sacred. And that, that's a beautiful thing to see. So I was walking around some um, sacred initiation sites last night. We have um, six six rings indentations into the ground which could be from a thousand to five thousand years old um, and it's in a land where the first homestead was established uh, in the 1840s by a man called George Evans and this area from a place called Red Hill Station to Buttle Jork Station uh, in Bottoms homestead uh, is what Bruce Pascoe writes about for anyone that's familiar with Dark Emu um, and it's an area of kangaroo grass um, highly um, highly treated land through biennial um, fire burning and things, and it was beautiful land. That land is also where the um, the ashes first happened because the land was seized uh, initially and the people from that clan, the Murrumbullock clan or the Boy Burrup, uh, were killed within four years because of smallpox. And so the first mansion was established in the state of Victoria right there um, called Rupert's Wood Mansion, which is now a high school um, called Salesian College. Um, where, yeah, the, the ashes, the first game between Australia and Britain happened on that land. But when the colonists first came there, they found that it was um, it was prime land. 25% of the uh, the land that was used there uh, pre-1750 um, native plants was all used uh, for pretty much everything. Acacia, eucalyptus, gum leaves, uh, wattle was used for, for tools, for food, for medicine, and all sorts of stuff like that. And eventually... Um, what they decided to do uh, in the 1850s was establish a private army uh, at that station. And they had this part of the creek uh, at Jackson's Creek, they had this corner called Cannon Gully. 
and was a place where there was competitions from the military where they would travel around the globe, up to Britain, back to the colony here, um, and they would create these amazing, uh, these amazing scenes, and then they would just blow it up with a gun. And so this area that was sacred initiation sites uh, all the way for a couple of thousand years, all the way to the 1850s, became uh, a showground for explosives. And so they're still finding um, all sorts of explosives under the ground at the moment. And the gun that they used uh, is sitting right up front of the RSL for some reason uh, in Sunbury, Kura Kura Cup, that's where it is, Sunbury. Um, so that land currently, back to what I was saying, um, if you look at the Victorian Planning Authority uh, or the Victorian Big Build, and you take a look at the land that's being seized at the moment, they are 50, 20, 30 years ahead of you. Um, people are living every day, uh, every single day, daily trying to survive in the colony. Um, and the Victorian Planning Authority from roads, bridges, schools, uh, hospitals, they've got the whole land already planned out where it's gonna be. Um, currently those sacred sites, a few hundred meters away, they have a bridge that goes over it. Um, they're gonna turn it all up into its own parkland. Um, some areas where we used to have oven mounds, and this is all from the colonists that wrote this. We had oven mounds, farms, all sorts of stuff. They've got, they've got a Kmart that's gonna go there. How good's a Kmart, right? The, the people in the local Facebook group say, but they don't know that that's gonna be built on top of sacred land. So yeah, about, um, I guess, demilitarized. Um, firstly, I think that Aboriginal people need to become more militant, actually. Um, we need to resist militancy with militancy. Um, and that is weeding out the compradors, the people that are selling off and ticking off our land. Because we have people right now that are um, cultural heritage officers that are going out onto that land, uh, either salvaging and taking the artifacts for it all to be concreted. And who's signing that off? Well, other Aboriginal people who are running the archeology span companies, who are running um, the corporations that are selling off this land. I'm not gonna have any land to take my grandchildren to not the same land that my grandfather took me through. So that's something that I think we really need to think about as Aboriginal people is that people are selling us out and we've got sellouts in the government that are listening and talking to the government right now about what they want. If that's Nova Paris, if that's Marsha Langton, Megan Davis, these are compradors that are selling our people out. Um, and in 50 years time, we could be wiped out because of these people that have got the ear of the government. What can we do? Well, you're doing it. <laughs> uh, I mean, what we are thinking about, as you know, every one of us, is how do we colonize best, decolonize best. And to do that uh, requires that we use whatever skills we have in our own minds and our bodies to affect the change. I wrote a book called Popular Resistance in Palestine where I listed hundreds of ways that people have acted in the past 140 years since that first uprising, first intifada, which was 1880, by the way, not uh, eight, 1987, as some people think. It was 100 years before that. And people have been innovative in actions of resistance, both on the ground in those countries that do this, wherever those are, and also globally, global solidarity was very effective in South Africa. Some of you are my age, maybe remember uh, 1980s activism we did for uh, against apartheid in South Africa and how we mobilized for boycott divestment sanctions, things like that. But uh, I mean, there are literally hundreds if not thousands of ways to resist. Resist is key, resistance is of course the essence of this. If you think of it like a disease, uh, colonialism as a disease that inflicts us, infects us, corrupts us, infects our mind, what is the response to colonialism is resistance. And resistance is of course justified in all these situations where there's colonization how do you resist? That's up to you and your background and your training and your religion and your whatever. Your, uh, I mean, I have, I have evolved my own ways of resistance. I one time even wrote 
an activist manual for resistance gives people tools. This was over 20, 25 years ago. It's still on my website. It's badly out of date and half the links don't work anymore. So if one of you is interested to for a project to update this and make a better activism manual based on our experiences in the US of uh, over 25 years of activism abroad, when we mobilized, we were very inventive. For example, we created the Wheels of Justice bus tour that traveled around the US, gave talks at 1,300 universities uh, and colleges, over 400 uh, middle schools and high schools, uh, churches also. We had hundreds of churches and mosques and even a couple of synagogues. We, we had success in this. It was innovative and it was like a gimmick, you know, moving around this colorful bus around 48 states in the US over six year period was a brilliant kind of action that a few activists came up with the idea. So you can come up with innovative things, a movement that you see on campuses now. You know, sometimes people reinvent things that happened in the past that seem to work. Campus activism is not new, but reviving it at this moment is a critical moment and it's growing and it's really important. So you can join it and act, but there's no one single recipe for liberation get that out of your mind. There's lots of recipes. And I believe in change in my own self in terms of the way I do activism. I evolved my own activism and the way I respond and the way I even approach Israelis or even approach Palestinians, corrupt people and etc. And how I deal with them, I evolve. Based on what? Based on knowledge of mistakes, trial and error, what works, what doesn't work, you try. As a scientist, we should also you know, think like science, how to do it. Colonialists, by the way, are very good at this. They have think tanks, they have colonial enterprises, they have the World Economic Forum, where they meet annually when they plot how to screw us even more. And uh, we have to think ahead of them. I disrupted, by the way, the World Economic Forum single-handedly with an innovative action. I can tell you that story, but again, I don't want to take too much time. But it cost them millions of dollars, the action that I did. And uh, so, it, it, you know, there, there's all sorts of things people can think of if they mobilize their head a little bit, but always explore where, you, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, there's something they call SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You do your own SWOT analysis for yourself. And based on that, you can decide where best to dedicate your services. And if you're an artist, for example, maybe end up being that you by drawing by these art things you're resisting. If you're a musician, maybe by music you're resisting. The, but the main thing is to resist. If you don't resist, if you don't mobilize, if you don't activate, actually apathetic people are more dangerous to me than uh, the Zionists, really. Mm -hmm. um, should I go ahead? Sorry, it's a bit dark over here. Um, because it's raining outside and uh, it's getting dark. Um, <clears throat> can you just indicate that you can hear me? Okay. Uh, if you show if you show your hand, I'll I can see that. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. This is a really a very good question, and I think I agree with all of what the panel members are saying. And just want to add a little bit more of, mm -hmm. of my own perspective. I think the the question is a difficult one, but I think. As uh, Professor Mazin uh, said, we are all doing it in one way or the other. But I do think that what we require at this point in time is to do it much better and faster. Um, the, one of the biggest problems for me is that the, the, the imperial world, the colonial world, the same Zionists and the 
complete those who are complicit in this genocide, the Western governments have the audacity to talk about human rights internationally. And this was really pronounced at uh, COP28 for the climate change meeting. And they were talking about mm -hmm. human rights as if they were champions. And for the life of us, many of us just couldn't stomach that, that fraud. And, and you know, while you are murdering people, you're causing a genocide, you're, and then they, they want to be climate champions as well. They talk about, you know, every country having to cut down emissions while the entire military industrial complex is all about and causing emissions and, and, um, and dependent on the fossil fuel economy. And from what I have also learned, the military industrial complex and the whole US and its weapons industry is actually carrying on a mass experiment on of new weapons um, in Gaza. And so this is really, really, uh, for those of us who are environmentalists, we're not just environmentalists, we're environmental justice campaigners, we are social justice campaigners. Mm -hmm. for, for Friends of the Earth International, we make this connection that if you'd have to, it's not just about fighting the, uh, you know, for the good cause of the environment, but it's really about the deep rooted systemic um, plunder that has gone on from centuries as we had spoken about earlier. And by the way, happy Mother's Day. And for me, for us, the most important mother is Mother Earth. And if we do not know how to respect Mother Earth and for those, those of them, the perpetrators of the crimes against humanity, the crimes against uh, the Mother Earth, you know, we they have to be punished of the you know with the of, of the highest order. So when South Africa took um, um, Israel to the ICJ, many of us sat in front of the TV. We were glued to the submissions. Thank God there was one government that was bold enough to bring um, Israel um, to the ICJ. But unfortunately, we can see how um, the ICJ also doesn't have any power really. But it's the moral and the persuasive value that that's important. But the, but the real point I wanted to stress is that um, we have had fractures also within the um, environmental and climate justice movement as well when this is, when what happened in Palestine um, happened. And we had groups in Germany, for instance, taking positions that, that were not in, 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 in alignment with the rest of us. And so it's quite sad that some groups of the North do not understand and have the deep analysis that many of us do, particularly those of us in the global south, in terms of what really is the meaning of settler colonialism, what's the meaning of um, of getting rid and freeing Palestine, and what connection that has with with um, with the environmental movement. And I think there is a deeper education that needs to be had. And congratulations to Friends of the Earth Australia for organizing this event and making those connections. So what we really need to do is, um, I, I agree with the resistance and all that, but I think the agitation, the most important agitation which has to come, and I was really, really happy to see the the, the, the Ivy Leagues and the campuses in the US erupt, um, just like they did during the Vietnam War or the um, fighting against the apartheid in South Africa. We really need that kind of uprising, uprising and really hold the Northern governments to account, particularly. Because what we have seen over and over again is the North or, well, in Australia, it's not the North, it's the North in the South. Um, they don't give a damn about our color, our, our you know, people of the South. They don't give a damn whether we live or we die. And that's a sad reality. And then they talk about human rights and they talk about, you know, how wonderful they are, Western civilization and so on and so forth. So, but I do think that the more that we hold the northern governments to account, and I mean Australia as well, and also the Arab states who have been complicit, what is unforgivable is those Arab states that are actually complicit or trying to normalize relations with, with Israel, which is really, really very, very heart-wrenching. So for all of us in these countries, we have to stand up, we have to fight, we have to resist, um, we have to protest. Um, we have to stand in the front lines and in many of our indigenous peoples or many of our local communities that we fight with, stopping the plunder and so on and so forth. But I can go on and on. But I think what's important at this point in time, the evil empire, this moment, this moment in history really is, an, is emblematic of the evil empire, which does not have any clothes. The emperor does not have any clothes. As naked as the emperor is, 
we need to expose that nakedness, the kind of uh, atrocities that are that are being, um, you know, uh, the genocide that's happening. You can't hide that anymore. So I do think that we need to escalate. We need to be in solidarity. We need to educate. We need to agitate. And um, there is no uh, justice in the world if what happens in Palestine carries on. And until Palestine is free, we ourselves are not free. And therefore, we have to continue the deep, deep solidarity. And of course, we want to change the world in whatever way, shape or form. And I think many of us are frontline of those struggles. So thank you. Do we still have Abir? Yes. yes. Bye. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Mina, for um, for the points and ideas that uh, you raised. Uh, actually, the uh, positive thing from this um, from this uh, war is uh, changing the uh, reality over all over the world. Uh, is um, uh, clarifying the, um, the the reality of uh, Israel uh, of uh, uh, of what is going what is going on the ground the genocide uh, uh, on the ground. Uh, so um, I think uh, this is important uh, period to. Uh, prove the the, um, the reality of uh, Israel and um, uh, boycotting um, uh, all the Israeli uh, corporations uh, engage more um, uh, in the uh, boycotting uh, campaigns and the uh, movements um, uh, boycotting the Israeli uh, corporations and supporting uh, corporations in uh, different uh, countries, um, uh, raise the uh, Palestinian voices. Uh, as uh, Mina uh, mentioned, that the current genocide cannot be uh, hiding more. So um, uh, raise the uh, uh, the uh, current uh, genocide all over the world uh, by uh, following different uh, ways um, for the universities, uh, highlighting the uh, Israeli violations um, uh, by doing uh, researches uh, on uh, different uh, violations uh, on the impact of the uh, current uh, Israeli attack uh, and the current uh, war against Gaza, uh, about the impact of uh, this uh, war on uh, different environmental uh, elements, on people life also in uh, Gaza, uh, work on, uh, working on legal aspects, uh, advocating the uh, Palestinian rights uh, to uh, live uh, within within uh, live safe uh, within uh, a basic uh, human right and environmental uh, uh, needs um, uh, so uh, uh, it is the time uh, to uh, work jointly on uh, different level and integrating our uh, work uh, environmental work and legal work and uh, work jointly uh, to resist and expose the uh, Israeli uh, violations and um, uh, the uh, Israeli uh, occupation reality and the uh, violations of the Israeli occupation uh, that uh, not only the violations, uh, also the um, uh, environmental crimes uh, that are practicing not, uh, currently uh, against the Palestinian environment and the uh, Palestinian people. Um, uh, so uh, we cannot uh, achieve uh, environmental uh, justice all over the world uh, without uh, uh, fighting for the environmental justice in Palestine and for the Palestinian people. Thank you. So we were going to take questions from the audience, but we are running quite late. I'm wondering if people perhaps can um, save their questions and ask them directly to some of the speakers. And maybe we will have a way for you to submit your questions to Mina and Abir um, later on. And if they have capacity to answer them, I can see that the room, like people are moving and, you know, we've been sitting for a while. So I'm kind of keen to, to stop it here. Um, unless someone is just like, no, I really, really, really need to ask a question. We're good? Okay. 
So I'm just going to quickly um, summarize some of the things that stood out to me about what we can do here. If uh, Jesse, can you pass a sign up sheet? I have an email list if people want to sign on to it. Uh, please go ahead and leave your email. There's a QR code if you want to scan it, or you can just write your name. But if you write your email, please make it legible. Otherwise, you will never hear from me again. <laughs> um, uh, okay, yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, I think it's not a super safe question to ask there. Um, maybe we can chat offline if that's okay. I might just like pin, put a pin in that. Yeah, yeah, just for safety. But I, I like the question. Um, <laughs> but offline. You're happy to um, I think I, yeah, I would like to not talk about it with the Zoom, um, if that's okay. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, we're all being watched. Can we close the room? The Zoom. There's people on the webinar. <laughs> but the Zoom. Don't don't worry. I'm not gonna say anything. That's disruptive. You know, if you study history of resistance to colonialism, as a scientist, I'm talking about not as what my preference. Of course, I have my own preferential forms of resistance. But if you study colonialism around the world, there's always a spectrum of resistance. A spectrum that includes all forms of resistance. There's a bell-shaped, actually, form of resistance. The end of it here is armed resistance, a small percentage, majority of it nonviolent or popular resistance, as we prefer to call it in Palestine, Muqawma Shabiya. And there is a tail at the other end, by the way, collaboration. Because a collaborator say that's a form of resistance. I'm engaged in diplomatic resistance. <laughs> you know, I'm talking. <laughs> this is this is the nature of the beast. This is this curve of resistance is going to exist whether here in Australia or so-called Australia or Palestine or South Africa or among the blacks in North America, you know. We have to remember there was Malcolm X, there was Martin Luther King in South Africa, there was Nelson Mandela who preferred armed resistance to the end. He said armed resistance is the way. And there were people like Desmond Tutu who said nonviolent resistance is the way. That's the nature of the resistance to have that spectrum. International law, by the way, is very clear. Occupied, oppressed people have a right to resist by any method they choose. Who's they? The people. They can choose. This person may choose this form. Another person may choose another form. And it's not up to you and me to decide for other people how they resist. You know what I'm going to say, but <laughs> very diplomatic. I wanted to I wanted to go over some of the things that stuck out to me from all of the uh, answers that we heard from the speakers about what we can do to move forward. Um, we're never going to solve this in two hours sitting on a panel, but, you know, this is one step. Starting from what, what uh, Mazen said, that we are doing it, that we are, you know, learning, we're educating ourselves, we're educating each other. That's one of the most important things we can do. Um, and then, um, yeah, we heard from Marisol talking about denouncing the actions of these governments and that our voices here matter, things like emailing and, you know, being in solidarity um, with people who are taking actions um, and the concept of global solidarity as well. And we can talk a little bit about um, you know, later on um, in in our journey as a movement here on this continent, what does solidarity actually look like? We also heard about um, mobilizing for uh, B BDS, so boycott, divest, and sanction, um, and um, so supporting um, supporting uh, yeah Aboriginal resistance and um, 
you know, for, for example, like the Black People's Union um, and all types of resistance that um, comes from uh, First Nations people and not just the type that uh, sounds uh, fun and cute and nice to us, um, recognizing that, you know, they have a right to resist in the way that they want to resist. Um, I think the most important thing that I got out of it is resisting in your own way. And so doing that SWOT analysis, uh, trying to figure out what your skills, what your background is, um, and then, you know, utilizing the diversity of tactics, not judging each other, not criticizing what other people are doing. You might sit on this side of the spectrum or that side, regardless, we are, um, you know, we have to support each other in our resistance, resisting better and faster, which is what uh, Mina said. Um, and, you know, uh, keep exposing the empire. And Abid also mentioned that um, raising Palestinian voices, finding legal ways that we can challenge what's going on. And it seems like we are all ready to escalate. It seems like the word uprising is coming across a lot. Um, when people are asking me, what are you up to lately? I'm like, I'm starting a fucking revolution. And that is where we need to go to. Um, because there is really no way out. It is expanding into a regional war. Um, it is going to probably become a global war. And you need to find your space in it. But also know that you can upskill and that you can move further from where you are now just by having these conversations. Um, again, Asia is listening to me. You know, we're all in this shit together. Um, but um, yeah, what I wanted to add, how I see us going forward as a community, as a movement, is, is uh, if each one of us finds three to four uh, trusted mates and you form a little group, and you sit down and you chat about, you know, what skills do you have? What skills do I have? Uh, find a target that you like, um, find a tactic that you like and fucking hit that target. This is really where we're up to now is that we, we need to be forming groups of people. And when I say hit that target, it could literally just be go and lobby an MP or it could be climb a crane, right? You just, you decide how you want that to look like but you need to form good, strong relationships within communities and not wait for leadership to tell you what to do. Right? Sounds good? Mm -hmm. So to wrap up, I wanted to say a massive thank you to all of our speakers, to Marisol, Jasper, Professor Mazen, to Amina and Abir um, joining us over Zoom. First, what is this? I hear it all. So, oh, okay. All right. okay. That's, that's one thing. But I was like, okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry. Yeah. And I just wanted to mention before you close, you know, that what's happening when you talk about ecocide before, What's happening in Brazil at the moment, I think is something that we all need to pay attention. You know, we are talking about more than 230,000 people displaced and people have been killed, but they don't know how many. So that shows when we talk about ecocide, when we talk about what these multinational corporations, companies are doing all around the world. Because we said before, it's all the people, yes? Yeah? The same people, same countries same companies and yeah and also yeah we, we can not uh, allow and I'm not going to answer your question about the violence but I just will say that direct action is important and needed now I just have this in my hand now and I'm just going to answer that question um, as easily as possible. You know, what is more violent, protesters or the colony, when we have hundreds and hundreds of people in the prisons dying um, from the same private prison companies that are running um, the apartheid wall and checkpoints in the West Bank? What is more violent, protesters or the colony? So, you know, the question about violence, about us being violent, the colonists are violent. They're the ones that are violent. They took our land, they killed our family, and they still kill our family, and they still take our land. So that's that's all I have to say on that.
I feel like I, I tried, but I failed <laughs> quite miserably, but that's okay. <laughs> I tried for the record. Um, <laughs> so again, thank you so much for all of our speakers. I wanted to uh, thank uh, Pengon, uh, which is uh, free. Not, it's Friends of the Earth Palestine. Um, and we've got a report here by Pengon that is called the Environmental Nakba Report just at the back. And so you can grab a copy of that if you like. It was um, published in 2011, is that right? 2013, yeah, with Fur International. And it there is some really incredible resources in there. So yeah, grab a copy for that uh, of that would be good. Um, wanted to also thank uh, Friends of the Earth Malaysia, International and Australia um, for, yep, everything. <laughs> Um, just to thank Black Spark as well for hosting us and, you know, make sure you donate some money. Um, plug for your website. You've mentioned palestinenature.org. Cool. Check that out. Shameless plug for Disrupt Wars, of which I'm the campaigner and definitely direct action. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of it for today. We are going to have my beautiful friend, Unur, who's going to be sharing... Uh, some Turkish music with us. We have some food, we have some drinks. Um, and yeah, if you've got some questions, I mean, do you, do you feel like you'd like to continue? Yeah, we can continue conversations. Questions that you want to give to Mina and Abir, come to me, I'll write them down and we'll try and get you some answers. Um, otherwise, yeah, just keep resisting and form a group. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, it's, <laughs> you shouldn't do this. Um, no, to repay you, I invite you to come to Palestine, spend time with us. You can volunteer. We offer room and board for volunteers. So it will all cost you the tickets from Australia to Tel Aviv or wherever you go through. And we, I would be honored if you come visit us. Don't come all at one time. <laughs> You know, but you're welcome. <laughs>